join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for uh, uh, the opportunity you're giving us today to worship. Thank you for these young people and for the precious people they are in your kingdom, Lord. Thank you for uh, the opportunity to have them lead us. Thank you for the opportunity to worship with them. We pray strength, blessing, and joy over their lives and hearts and ask that uh, they would grow in faith and their obedience and faithfulness to you in all things, Lord. And just be with each one of the people leading in worship today. I pray also for uh, members who are recovering from different things and uh, some who are traveling because of vacation, some who are uh, doing different things. I ask that they all would uh, be able to be uh, blessed and uh, protected and guarded, Lord. We pray for those who are sick, uh, recovery and full healing. We ask in your mercy, grace, Lord, that, uh, uh, that you would just watch over the needs that they have as individuals. And Lord, uh, use this day for your glory. We are your people gathered together by the power of your spirit to worship empowered by your spirit to uh, bring blessing and joy uh, into your heart because of what you're doing in us, with us, and through us. So come and bless us as we begin in your name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and God's people say. Amen. We join together in the open song. That's too loud. That's too loud. Please stand and join us for worship this morning, everyone. God is good. All the time. All the time. Here we go. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord I'm trading my sickness I'm trading my pain I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord oh, We're singing yes Lord, yes Lord, yes, yes Lord Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned, struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. That his joy is going to be my strength. And though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning, yeah. I'm trading my sorrows. I'm trading my shame. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down joy of the Lord. His people sing, we're singing. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Amen. I am pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. Struck down but not destroyed. I am blessed beyond the curse, for his promise will endure. That his joy is gonna be my strength. And though the sorrow may last for the night, his joy comes in the morning. Oh, I'm trading my sorrows, I'm trading my shame, I'm laying them down joy of the Lord. I'm trading my sickness. I'm trading my pain. I'm laying them down for the joy of the Lord. Oh, we're singing yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. One more time, here we go. We're singing. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, yes, Lord, amen. Yes, yes, Lord, amen. Uh, 
All right, so for this next one, we got some girls and some guys splitting some stuff. But you can sing whatever you want to, or you can follow along with us. We have men starting off, and ladies, we are echoing.
when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm coming back to the heart of worship. When it's all about you, it's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I made it. When it's all about you, it's all about you. We join together in the confession as it's printed in the bulletin. Almighty God, our maker and redeemer, we poor sinners confess to you that we are by nature sinful and unclean, and that we have sinned against you by thought and word and deed. Therefore, we flee for refuge to your boundless mercy, seeking and imploring your grace for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. O oh, most merciful God, since you have given your only begotten Son to die for us. Have mercy on us, and for his sake grant us forgiveness of our sins. And by your Holy Spirit, increase in us true knowledge of you. To the end, by your grace, we may come to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, has had mercy on us and has given his only son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe on his name, he gives power to become the children of God and has promised them his Holy Spirit. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. Grant this Lord unto us all. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat> A couple of verses, sections today. First one comes out of the book of Acts. Uh, this is Paul getting ready to leave the Ephesians. And uh, so it's a kind of a sad time for the Ephesians. But uh, Paul has been with them for an extended period of time. So it's in Acts 20, if you look at it up there, starting at verse 17. <clears throat> From Miletus, Paul sent to Ephesus for the elders of the church. When they arrived, he said to them, You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. From the first day I came into the province of Asia, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears, although I was severely tested by the plots of the Jews. You know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly and from house to house. I've declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus. And now, compelled by the Spirit, I am going to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there. I only know that in every city the Holy Spirit warns me that prison and hardships are facing me. However, I consider my life worth nothing to me. If only I may finish the race and complete the task the Lord has given me the task of testifying to the gospel of God's grace. Now, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent the blood of the blood of all men, for I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. Keep watch over yourselves and all the flock, of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, be shepherds of the church of God, whom he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw many disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold 
or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak, remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. When he had said this, he knelt down with all of them and prayed. They all wept as they embraced him and kissed him. What grieved them the most was his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they accompanied him to the ship. If you'd like to turn to the next one, it comes out of Matthew chapter 7. Here again, the end of the Sermon on the Mount. Middle of three sections, uh, most are familiar to you. The first little section I'm not reading to you, but will refer to is the narrow gate and the wide gate. And uh, please note that there is also a road that leads to those things. There is a way that has to be done. And then afterwards, the wise and foolish builders. But we're reading from verse 15. So Matthew 7, starting at verse 15. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are for ferocious wolves. By their fruit you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons, and perform many miracles? Then I will say to them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Here ends the reading. I'd like to invite children to come down, if you would, and two strong men from the group to come up who are volunteering for me today. <clears throat> That's one. Ah, oh. oh, some of them can be the father. I'll let you be the father. We'll get all three of you up here. No, you're the oldest. You'll be the dad. All right. Come on, stand in the middle right here where the kids are. Good. All right. Here we go, kids. We have a father, and he's got two sons, and he's got some work that needs to be done, okay? So the father tells the sons to go out into the field and do all the work that's needed out there. Go ahead, father. And the first son responds, and then the second son reacts and says, I don't know how much you hate gardening. I hate gardening. It's stupid. And I don't want to be in the hot sun. I don't want to be out in the sun. It's Good. Too warm. I feel like Satan. <laughs> More bad things. Stick your tongue out at him and walk away. <laughs> Good. Sit and you walk over there. <clears throat> so he sat down over there. The other son sat down or, st or stood over there. And we waited a long time. But here's something that changed. The one son who said... What did this son say? Yes or no? He said he would? Is that the one that said he would? Yes. Yeah. He didn't go and do it. He sat there, watched TV, and played on his phone. <laughs> the other son stood up, tapped himself in the head, and said, I have been very wicked. I think I should have listened to my father. I will go into the field and do what he tells me. And he went into the field and he did what he was told and began to hoe and rake and pull weeds. Row, hoe, and rake and pull weeds. Vigorously. Yeah, there we go. Jesus asked a very important question of the people that were there. He said, which of this father's two sons behaved themselves? Yeah. 
and did the will of the Father. Which son did the will of the Father? That one. Even though at first he was really what? Naughty. He was very naughty at first. Finally, he came to his senses. Come on back, sons. Come on back, sons. Did this guy do the will of his father? No. So he gets no candy. <laughs> That's the way the crum cookie crumbles, right, Dad? Yeah. Go back to your seat. Get out of here. Dad, no, no, not you. You're the good son. <clears throat> so the good son, the father said, here, take two pieces of candy. <laughs> And the father took one so he could go back and munch in front of the other son who gets nothing. <laughs> and that was the parable Jesus told. I want to teach you a Latin word this morning. Some of you know German words. Some of you may know other words that your parents have taught you that aren't English. English is the language that we all speak that we normally understand. So if I look at you and say, Guten Morgen, what did I say? Good morning, yes. Some people understand it, some people don't. I'm going to teach you a Latin word today, and the word is Kyrie. Can you say that? Kyrie. Kyrie. And Kyrie means Lord. In my sermon today, the people that are going to be speaking, they say, Kyrie, Kyrie. Lord, Lord. And Lord means Who's the one that you listen to above all else? And in my sermon today, I want you to notice what happens with the word Kyrie, Kyrie. Okay, can you say it one more time? Kyrie, good. And there is a treat for you. And is there anyone here with a soft heart? Because there's a crying boy over there <laughs> who, who feels really left out. So I need one of you kids to take an extra piece of candy or something over to him because whatever you think he might enjoy or take two because they're small all right grab what you can grab what you want yeah that's right is she gonna do it fantastic that's all right you got that's okay hurry up honey take the one mom told you to take yep who's got a oh, wait I got a bird here well do I get to keep him All right, I've got to start this sermon with a kind of a, uh, I don't know, I'm quite sure what to call it. Uh, this is a, a technique I'm using in my sermon. You can love it or hate it. Uh, I am not a doctor, nor do I play one on TV, as they say. However, I uh, had an experience this week where uh, I knew someone that became very sick with COVID. I think it's the new one that's going around. Was taken uh, eventually to the hospital. And uh, in, uh, got fed up with the hospital and what they were doing for him, wasn't changing anything. He had developed a level of pneumonia, and so he walked back out and had his doctor that was taking very good care of him, and he's doing just fine right now. So I'm not recommending or discussing that part. But in the hospital, they found out that all the people in the hospital with COVID in this particular hospital, except him, had had the shot. Okay. Now, that doesn't, I'm not a doctor, nor do I play one, but that is the truth of what they learned from this particular hospital. Everybody in the hospital with COVID had had the shot, all right? So uh, I want to set this up for you in a little way because I'm going to go and use it in my sermon, so brace yourself a little bit, but here we go. If you get sick with any of the symptoms, go to the doctor right away, Okay? The moment you think you got it, all of the symptoms, smell, taste, aches, pains, headaches, all the junk that you can ever heard about COVID, go and say, Doc, I want you to get started right away on hydrochloroquine and or ivermectin now, today. And if he won't or she won't, find a different doctor. All right? Find a different doctor. Why? Because if you catch this junk early... You don't have to pay, because his wife also came down with it. Took the stuff right away, 
no symptoms hardly at all. Daughter also was exposed to mom and dad, took the stuff, had nothing, got basically a zero result from it. Now, is this inspired by God? Not yet. It's my illustration for my sermon. So are you keeping this all in proper kind of perspective? Or I'm telling you what I would do for whatever that's worth. But that's the truth, okay? And here's the point, ultimately. There are other things that, but start right away. Don't delay. He got fed up being in the hospital. He said, you're not doing me any good. He, he left, and he's doing just fine. I don't think that's a good recommendation, but it is where it's at. So now into the middle of this, I want us to drop the text that I'm about to read, okay? And I want you to understand how difficult sometimes life is because there are so many contradictory opinions uh, from experts on both sides, unfortunately. People who have had, you know, five, six, ten years of education plus who are experts in their areas. One says this, the other says that. And the truth of what was revealed to me this, uh, this week is that all the people in this particular hospital from the, dirt, the nurse that this person was talking to came in with COVID, had to be treated, and are in the hospital, all had been vaccinated. Now, that means you've got to wake up. Here's the warning. Wake up, be alert, understand it's still out there. Don't play games with it. That, I think, is pretty consistent across the board. But now I want you to listen to the first words of our text, okay? The first words of our text are watch out or be aware, pay attention. Don't play games, in this case, with false prophets. Our text is going to tell us the same thing. Don't think somehow you're insulated from the evil, the wickedness, the junk, the COVID equivalent in my illustration that's out there. Pay attention, and here's the second part. Deal with it immediately. If you can't change the person or the false prophet that's bringing the information to you, walk away from the situation. Find another individual, group, church, fellowship, or whatever it is you're going to have to do. Because that's the directive. All right? So here is uh, Jesus speaking. We're coming to the end of the Sermon on the Mount, and this has some of the most frightening verses in it that you can possibly imagine, okay? Watch the last verse, verse 23, that we read to you. Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. That's damnation language. All right? So now you've got the setting. You've got life and death, the same way, unfortunately, COVID can be for people. You've got all this kind of junk, I'm kind of using it as an analogy illustration. But in the middle of this, there is a spiritual COVID, a spiritual virus, a spiritual disease brought to you from different sources, some who you may least expect, but you don't get the opportunity to be ignorant. It will nail you, it will pull you down, it will destroy you and your family, without flinching, okay? The nature of the demonic, the nature of wickedness is it has no preference for maleness, female maleness, age, or anything else. You are vulnerable to it. And so in Jesus' language, at the end of the Sermon of the Mount, he's waking you up. He's going, pay attention. Watch out. You heard Paul refer to it when he was leaving the Ephesians, telling them, they will come in among you like wolves, ravenous, tearing in li you limb from limb. They don't particularly care. We can call it, they get that smell of blood and death, and they begin to just react in kind of an animalistic behavior. That's the warning. And it says that's the enemy that's out there trying to destroy you, your marriage, your family, your life, your values, everything else that you can imagine. Like a ravenous wolf, it walks in among the people in the church, not just existing outside the church, all right? So now we try and put this all together. It says this, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ferocious wolves. They will look perfectly reasonable on the outside. 
inside you're going to have to be aware there's something terrible going on. Whatever the a power of the word ravenous in the, in the Greek, it's a powerful word. It, it implies this, you know, tearing and ripping and, and never ceasing, just getting into that bloodless kind of mentality. And so this is among you, and he says, you have got to watch for it. Whether it's this person, that one sitting next to you, somebody else in your own family, your own child coming back from college, or any number of sources around you, you have to be aware and recognize when false prophets are proclaiming and speaking. Okay? So that's the challenge you have to understand and be aware of. By their fruit, you will recognize them. And then he goes on from that point, and he says, you've got to recognize in real life, you don't get a fig tree, for as he points out there, uh, from, uh, or excuse me, fig tree, uh, lost my verse there, pick grapes from thorn bushes or uh, uh, figs from thistles. And you begin to understand, well, that's a perfectly logical point. I can't go to an apple tree and, and pick something that's not going to grow on an apple tree. I can't go to a thistle and expect it to produce something like figs or a thorn tree. And he says, the trouble is also that the ferocious wolves will produce the fruit that they produce. And you have got to be smart enough to recognize it, see it, understand it, and not be deceived by it. All right? Now, I gave you a block of information. That may or may not be accurate. Are you discerning enough to figure it out for yourself? I can tell you what I might do. It may be right. It may be wrong. When I go to a doctor, I have to trust what the doctor is saying, but I also am responsible, like this young man was, where he said, I'm walking. This is not working. You're not doing a thing for me. I'm just sitting here. And he walked, and he went home, and again, he's doing fine and recovering. But in the middle of that, are you discerning enough to know that which is right from that which is incorrect, that which is beneficial from that which is foolishness? That becomes your challenge, whether in the pragmatic way that we deal with right now in terms of COVID and our reaction to it, if we develop a symptom or anything else like that, or whether we deal with it in some other situation of our life in the spiritual realm. Do you recognize when the person up front talking has moved away from faithfulness to the word of God? Do you understand when they are speaking to you and you get the phone call from the neighbor or the friend and they're pulling you in a direction that you should not be pulled, and they're speaking words like, thus saith the Lord, and somehow God told us to do this, that, or whatever the case might be. So he goes on from this, and he says in 17, likewise every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. Jesus liked this analogy. He figured it out. If you've ever seen a bad tree, you don't have to be very old to recognize an apple tree is really in sad shape. And the apples might be just horrible looking and everything else like that, covered with all the different junk that can cover them, worms and everything else. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Here's a kicker I want to add for you. The false prophet or the true prophet, part of their fruit is you. You don't like your wife? Well, dump her. Find a new one. Or forget it. Just go. People are out there. They'll give you anything anyway. What difference does it make? How does that feel? Is that a good word or a bad word? How do you determine that? How do you recognize it? How do you find it out? You understand? How do you recognize when people are living their life and producing good fruit or bad fruit? That is really not all that difficult. Rule of thumb. If they're hiding it from everybody, there's something major wrong with it. If you can't bring it out into the open to be evaluated... There's something major wrong with it. More than likely, it's ungodly, uncharacteristic of the will of God, and a variety of other things. So be very alert to that kind of warning that you get down there. It goes on and in verse 19. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is, very simple gardening kind of concept, vine kind of concept, farmer kind of concept, uh, is cut down and thrown into the fire. I don't want that tree to spread, spread any of its infection to any other part of my garden, my orchard, or whatever, or my, my vineyard, or whatever it might be. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And so you begin to understand 
this process that is actually significant. And you begin to recognize some of the characteristics of false prophets. I just picked one or two out of 2 Corinthians. It goes, they're false, they're deceitful workmen. They masquerade as apostles of Christ. They're not going to walk in here in sheep's clothing. They're going to masquerade as righteous people. They're going to be the, sometimes the very leaders you're listening to, whether it's here or any place else. And so you have to understand that. They masquerade as apostles of Christ. Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light, which is exactly what false prophets do. Uh, I'm going to help you now. You've got to get the re- you know, that kind of thing. Another set comes out of Colossians. They, uh, uh, captive, where they capture you with hollow and deceptive philosophy, ideas and concepts uh, of the world, human tradition and basic principles of the world. Well, it sounds so logical to the world. If you're not happy in your marriage, get rid of her. Divorce. If you don't like this person, don't ever forgive them again. They don't deserve it. It's all right to carry a grudge, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All you have to do is find yourself, in some cases, going to the psychiatrists that have no mooring in the word of God or the wisdom of the Lord. They can't even tell you the truth. They can't use the word sin or righteousness or anything else. They can't move in those directions. And so scripture points that out also. And it identifies some of these same characteristics. And it says this. Spirit clearly says, uh, this comes out of Timothy, that in later times some will abandon the faith, follow deceiving spirits. They're not just them alone. I played for you that song by the San Francisco, if you were in, in Bible study last Sunday, by the San Francisco Gay Man's Choir. And it's, we're coming for your children. We're going to get them. We are going to you know, enlighten them with our kind of enlightenment. We're coming for your children. You better accept that. And they sang that song. And I said, as I heard it just from the very first time, this song is demonically charged. Immediately that came to my discernment. It's demonically charged, not just because of who sang it, but the song is catchy. You'll find yourself singing it, and it will bypass your normal resistance to stand against it. So you have to understand, you can wear everything you want to wear. I've been told the virus comes through and nails you anyway. All right? Whatever you want to see, sin, wickedness, the compromise of the, of the, of the church and pastors and whatever you want to say, you have to recognize, wake up, don't be deceived, don't let this happen to you. And he points that out repeatedly for us in that very thing. All right? So it says, that's where you're going to end up, even if the tree ends up being thrown into the fire, which is exactly what you're going to hear in three verses now. Starting in verse 21 then, if you would, please. Not everyone who says to me, Kyrie, Kyrie. You hear it, kids? There it is. Not everyone who says to me, Kyrie, Kyrie, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Don't use words. Don't walk around thinking, I prayed the prayer, and that's all that's required. You know, once listened to a preacher, just nailed that. He says, go ahead, find that prayer in the Bible. Pray this prayer, and you're automatically saved. You won't find it. And he pointed that out and says, don't listen to that. He said, read Scripture. Get your nose back in the Bible. And his point was not to undermine people's faith, but to teach them what it really meant. It's like said, I like, you know, like the joke I like to use, the only one joke I maybe know, where the <laughs> husband, uh, his wife goes, why don't you ever tell me why you love me anymore? And he said, I did when we got married. I said, I'd love you. He said, I'll, I'll, I'll let you know if I change my mind. And he never told her that. And you begin to go, are we really capable of that? And I go, unfortunately, some version of that is possible. Kyrie is repeated because it's a serious. We would raise our voices if we wanted to make a point, all right? Or put it in capitals in our text or underline it or whatever we have uh, available with exclamation points and angry faces with claws or something. Uh, in the Greek and the Hebrew, they repeat. Kyrie, Kyrie. This is not an accident. This is Lord, Lord. And then it goes on. Please understand the significance of this point that he's making. Jesus' point says, don't think just because you use my name in a prayer that we have a relationship. I heard an analogy given by a, a person that said, if I go up to the White House 
And I say, I know the president. And you think they'll let me in? And he said, no, they won't. He said, if the president comes out the door and he looks at you and says, come on in, Bruce, he said, that's the difference between me knowing the president's name and the president knowing my name. Well, Kyrie, Kyrie, you know, these people shouting out, Lord, Lord, Jesus, Jesus. They're using the right language, but the warning comes and you can feel Jesus' pressure on these people. And remember, while the Sermon on the Mount feels like pressure, its ultimate focus is really to rescue you, to bring you out of your lethargy, to help you understand what evidence, what sign, what marks do you have in your life. And it doesn't tell you, go out and start doing them so you can impress people. But if, for instance, you were in a serious car accident and you got hit by a semi and you go, uh, you know, in the front of your, the whole car is smashed and you come walking in going, yeah, a, car, a semi just came, crushed the whole car I was in. And, you know, they'd look at you and say, there's no evidence that you were ever in a car accident. And you understand, when you meet the Lord, it's like being hit, in a sense, by a truck. There should be evidence in my attitudes, my actions, my behaviors, my sensitivity to sin. It isn't that I don't sin or that I simply have conquered it in my actions and behaviors. It's that when I sin, I immediately feel the tap of the Holy Spirit, the conviction of God saying, this is wrong, turn and walk in a new direction, don't walk down this path, don't listen to this word, don't keep going in the direction I'm going. When I stop listening to that, I am becoming hard-hearted. I'm sealing myself off from the work of the Holy Spirit. I can still recite Kyrie, Kyrie, Lord, Lord. I can still wear the face of a Christian. I can still dress but you will eventually begin to see the changes in my life, actions, and behaviors. You will begin to see the secrecy again. You'll begin to see the privacy of I'm not sharing this. You'll begin to hear different languages. My Aunt Kathy died this last week, and I'm going to get to do the funeral for her on Tuesday. That's up in Wild Rose, so pray for me that I'll be given the right words. But my Aunt Kathy was always a Christian by definition, but later on in her life, uh, she got a, went through a situation, and don't want to go through all the details, but when I met her again many years later, she married my Uncle George, she was a totally different woman. You had no, uh, no doubt who she belonged to. She would say, hi, I'm Kathy, I know Jesus. Do you know Jesus? I mean, she would do it with a sweetness that, you know, all the things that I don't have. But the point ultimately is the evidence of a relationship with God cannot be stifled. When it's stifled, hindered, shut down, <coughs> hidden away, or you're disguising yourself, or I have to come into your presence and fake it, all right, then I know Kyrie Kyrie is now putting me, I'm using the right words, but there's no intimacy between me and, the, and God. I know him, I know Jesus, I can say his name, Lord, Lord, Kyrie Kyrie, but he is not going to know me. And that's why when we go into the next part, coming out at that point, it says, many will say to me on that day, and that's a sad number, unfortunately, Kyrie, Kyrie, and then watch the list. Did we not prophesy in your name? Didn't we proclaim good stuff, godly stuff and everything else? And in your name, drive out demons, two things. Third one, and perform many miracles. Those are not the signals. Those alone are not the fruit that you keep watching for. Then I will, turn, will tell them plainly, I never knew you away from me, you evildoers. The final statement of judgment. And you go, why would Jesus do this? Well, he immediately goes from here into the next parable. I wasn't going to read it to you, but I want you to remember it. It says, what are you going to do with this information? And it says, a certain man built his house on the sand. And the rains came and pushed, pushed against it and knocked the house down because it wasn't built on any absolute foundation. Oh, it had a foundation. It had become sand. And this is the other thing. I can be once built on the rock and then begin to turn and find myself built on sand, wondering why my world, my life, my faith, my relationship with Christ is collapsing 
The moment I get pressured, the moment I get tempted, some new good-looking girl, good-looking guy comes along and I find myself suckered in by the same stupid stuff I should know better, but I'm built on sand, I have no resistance, and my world, my life, my faith collapses. And the second example he gives, you can take the same information and build on the rock, the rock of God's word, the rock of accuracy, the rock of precision, the rock of truth. Bring it out into the open. Put it into the light. This congregation would have no trouble discerning right from wrong in any one of our lives. I wouldn't necessarily give you all of my nasty details, but you wouldn't have any problem revealing and knowing to me whether it's righteous or unrighteous. You have no problem recognizing bad fruit or good fruit as long as you have the Spirit of God in your life yourself. That's why we respond. And so his whole point, you have to understand this, I never knew you becomes the one thing Jesus wants to avoid in your life. He isn't saying this to scare you in one sense. It is scary because you begin to go, but I, I preached and I, I prayed for and I saw miracles take place. And yeah, Bruce, I have no idea who you are. And I go, let that rest in your heart a moment and you start to understand the implication. What are you building your life on? So many times we go to church we watch things, listen to music, behave in ways that are so contrary to the will of God, and yet we're praying, oh, Lord, fill me with your Holy Spirit. And we're all capable of this. This is not something that is just unique to one or two of us. This is the characteristics of how we begin to function. And not one of us alone is subject or alone to the small little bites Satan likes to take out of our life. And you begin to understand, I will trip you up through this person, through this neighbor, through this friend, through this compromise, through who you hang with. And all of a sudden, that nasty four-letter word you hardly ever said starts coming out of your mouth with you thought hardly thinking about it. And you go, how did I get here? And the Lord says, look at the friends that you are acquainting yourself with and you're not walking in the power of my spirit when you're around them. And so you begin to see his whole point ultimately Wake up, recognize the symptoms, make the decision to deal with it early, function with it the way I've commanded you to function with it, so that you never hear, I have no idea who you are. It actually implies, not even at any time did I know you. You never belonged to me at all. And you begin to go, that's the power of the Greek sometimes. The translation is correct, but the power of the Greek is not at any time were you mine. And you begin to recognize, how did it happen that way? You get people you know, praying the prayer, and two days, two weeks, two years later, they're gone. Even our own conviction as a congregation. They rise, they grow older, they walk away. What are we doing right or wrong? That's the challenge. That's the opportunity. So here I'm preaching it, but I'm also feeling the conviction of it Lord, what do I need to do so that when I say Kyrie, Kyrie, it is coming out of a sincere heart with truth and integrity and everything else like that. And so I want to build my life, my relationship with Christ on the rock, and I don't want to give room to all the subtle temptations, viruses, sins, and all the other things that I would associate with it to end up in that bad situation. God is offering that privilege and that promise to us today. He is speaking to your heart, and he's going, speak, shout, Lord, Lord, I can't think of anything better. It's like when I tell people I love the word grandpa. I love it. My grandkids can shout that at me every day. It doesn't bother me a bit. I never could understand when people say, don't call me grandpa. Call me sir or something. I don't know. <laughs> you know I, people do that, and I go, why? It's beautiful. And it also identifies the relationship. So Jesus wants you to shout out, Kyrie, Kyrie, Lord, Lord. But he wants it to come from a heart that's real, a heart that's sincere, a heart that's submitted, a heart that's repentant. As we saw the one son repent and go out and uh, do the, way, the weeding and the ho hoeing and everything else he had to do, you begin to understand that's the one, Kyrie, Kyrie, he will hear. The other son who sat there or stood there and did nothing, he'll hear Kyrie, Kyrie out of his mouth 
and he'll be headed straight for hell. Do you understand? That's how simplistic this is. That's how clean it is. That's how reality it is. One that responds with repentance and does the work. The other lies through their teeth, but never goes ahead and manifests the fruit. You will know them by their fruit. Pray with me, if you would. Lord, uh, this is your day, and we're, we're your people. And we know, Lord, that we are as capable of, as anyone else of getting caught and deceived by the lies of Satan and the, the whispers of the world and the contradictory authoritative remarks and statements that are out there. I pray, Lord, that in the middle of all of this, that you would continue to work. I pray, Lord, for a safety in the physical realm for my congregation and my people here, Lord. Give them a wisdom, discernment, and, and a focus and a clarity of uh, what they would do. But more importantly, Lord, I pray for all of us that spiritual clarity, recognizing compromise wherever it creeps into our life, recognizing the moment repentance is not there immediately after the sin is recognized, recognizing how easy it is to say, Lord, Lord, and finally become so cold that we have no relationship with you at all. And you'll have to look at us, us and say, I have no idea who you are. Lord, uh, let that not happen to any man, woman, or child in this fellowship of this congregation. Draw us into your presence and fill us with hope. We pray this all in your name, Jesus. God's people say, Amen. Amen. As we prepare for communion, this is the Lord's table. He invites you to it. It's important to remember that. Uh, we're still doing uh, the way we did uh, with separation and everything else, so honor that as you come forward and uh, recognize what we're doing here. Remember the gluten-free Wafers are on the little plate, and uh, the, if you can't handle the wine or anything, you can take the center ones in the center tray. So, uh, When God invites you, it's between you and him. When you come to his altar, it's between you and him. I don't have, as a pastor, the power or personality or authority in one sense other than to proclaim what God has said already is correct. Your sins are forgiven. This is his invitation. You come forward, and if you're that son, that sets you up to receive all that God has for you. If you're this son, smiling and saying, yes, yes, but your heart is hardened, try and figure out how to deal with that because God is asking us, if you have that sin or someone even has a sin against you, deal with them right away like a disease or a sickness or anything else. As we join together, we hear the words God said. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Lord, you are always faithful, you are always good. And your gentleness and your invitation and even your stiff warnings are warnings given by the tender love of a Savior who has only one desire, to see my face in his kingdom forever and ever. So I pray, Lord, that you would break into my world, into all of our worlds, bring those people forward who are in need of the forgiveness that has been won for them by you at the cross. Give them your blood, your body, and share with them the good news that their sins are forgiven because of what you have done for them and that they belong to you and that you know their name. Pray this all in your name. Amen. All is ready. You may come forward.
Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a dream on the way?
Lord God, Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord, humbly, Lord. It is a privilege to come before you in prayer, Lord God. It is a gift, Lord, that you have given to us, Lord, with your death on the cross and your resurrection, Lord, that you made a way back to the Father where we can come to you, Lord, in prayer and bear our hearts and our souls to you. Lord God, we pray with Jan and Jody this morning, and we pray for your comfort and peace to be upon Jan, Lord, as she has been told she has just a few days left of life here on this earth. Lord God, we just pray that your peace would be upon her, Lord. We pray, Lord, that your Holy Spirit would envelop her, Lord, and just give her comfort, Lord, and uh, remove any fear, Lord, and uh, just fill her, Lord, with the hope of knowing that she'll be re reunited with you, Lord, very quickly, Lord. And be with, um, uh, with Jody, Lord, and be with all those, Lord, who are going to be remaining here on this earth. Comfort them, Lord, in their grief and in their mourning. And be near them, Lord, and fill their hearts, Lord, with, with joy even in the midst of such great sorrow. We pray that in your name, Lord Jesus. Lord, we pray for Pam, who has a friend who had to have her kidney removed last Monday, Lord, due to cancer. And Lord, we just ask, Lord, that your healing would be upon Pam. And Lord, we pray that again you would remove any fear from her heart, Lord God. We lift her up into your hands, Lord, and I just pray for all doctors and all uh, caregivers who are going to be determining next steps after this kidney is removed and what treatments would, would come next, Lord. We pray, Lord, against any side effects of uh, upcoming treatments, Lord, and just healing, Lord, and everything that is required for, for Pam, Lord, to continue on, Lord, after this surgery. And Lord, we pray with Sandy this morning a prayer of thanksgiving that her son Brian um, has been released from the hospital and that he is recovering uh, slowly uh, at home from the Delta COVID virus and from pneumonia. But Lord, we also pray for a Dr. Janice Alexander who also has pneumonia. And we pray, Lord, for someone named Janine who is 58 years old and just found out that she has cancer two weeks ago and that she's starting chemo treatments on Monday, Lord God. Lord, be with these, your, your people, Lord, and just touch them and heal them, Lord. Protect everyone here, Lord, from any side effects uh, of treatments and of, of the illnesses that they've had, Lord, and grant your speedy recovery and your healing, we pray in your name, Jesus. Father, we pray for a man named Phil Paulus who's in the hospital with congestive heart failure and needs an aortic valve replacement. Give doctors discernment, wisdom, timing, all the things that are necessary. And uh, we pray for a successful surgery. We pray for the strength that he needs. And we ask, Lord, that in the middle of this, your hand of mercy and grace would be evident in his life and on the doctors who are making and helping him through this time. We pray, Lord, for brothers and sisters, fellow Christians in Nigeria, who are under intense persecution uh, by ex Islamic extremists. Uh, 140 students from a Baptist school were kidnapped and are now enslaved. Lord, uh, our life can be very difficult. There are things we're afraid of. But when our sons and daughters go to school or when we walk out the door, this is not quite the thing that we have to be terrified of. These brothers and sisters are putting their lives on the line, saying they follow you. We ask, Lord, for the kind of courage that they demonstrate we ask, Lord, for the kind of courage we need, and I pray, Lord, for a faithfulness. Bring those children back, rebuke and destroy, and bring down those forces that are stealing children from their parents and are breaking down the, the walls simply because they believe in you, and Lord, uh, set them free, and uh, pray for healing for that nation all over the place as it's struggling with this kind of behavior in a very serious way. And Lord, we ask that in your mercy, you would continue to work in our lives. We join together in the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And I is not but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power 
and the glory forever and ever. Amen. This week I watched a YouTube presentation on what's going on in Nigeria and the person giving the presentation said there was a young boy somewhere around eight, nine years old who the Muslims had captured and had thrown him to the ground and they asked him if you deny Christ just deny Christ you won't die and he said I don't want to die, I don't want to die please don't kill me, please don't kill me but I cannot deny Christ put five bullets in his stomach. That is a level of commitment God needs to call us to. That is a level of understanding. I don't want to have any of us have to deal with that, but that's the call that God has to keep on our hearts, to have that kind of courage, obedience, and faithfulness. So as we uh, join together, would you please rise for the blessing as we get ready for our last song. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. We join in our last song. We actually have two, so you can go ahead and sit back down. Thank you. <laughs> he didn't read the bulletin. <laughs> but as we, as we just came off of prayer, this is a really special song uh, to me. And, um, and it's just amazing that we can go to our Heavenly Father and He knows everything about us and He still listens to us when we ask Him for things or when we need something from Him. Um, and He still loves us completely. So sing along if you know it, um, but this is known.
And as we go into this last song, um, I've been at this church mostly my whole life, and when I was confirmed, this was the song I actually got to sing for the congregation way back when I was a little person. Um, and uh, this will be my last time leading worship, and uh, my last Sunday here for at least a while. Um, so before I head out, I just wanted to thank the entire congregation. Thank you for all these years of supporting and encouraging me and um, blessing my socks off in more ways than I can count and praying for me, uh, praying for my future husband. You know, it's, I appreciate all you guys. <laughs> um, but for real, this has been such a blessing to be a part of this congregation and a part of this family. And um, I thank you for allowing us to lead with you guys today. And uh, I love each and every one of you, and I will miss you dearly. So, please stand and join with us as we sing one of my absolute favorite songs in the entire world.
Could we give a praise thank you offering to the kids and Sarah today for it? Thank you guys so very much. Appreciate it. Sit down just for